Good morning. My name is Leanne Colonna, and I'm a postdoc researcher at the Swedish Institute for Law and International. And over the past three years, I have been studying the concept of privacy by design within the context of my EU Horizon 2020 project called CAL which is about the development of privacy aware and acceptable light logging technologies for older and frailer individuals. Over the course of my research, I have discovered that while the idea of privacy by design is highly seductive in theory, uh, there are a lot of issues when it plays out on the ground. And because of this, I decided to get this expert group of panelists together so we could dig in a little bit deeper into the concept and what it means in practice. Um, and in particular, we're going to discuss the scope and enforcement of Article 25 within the context of the pandemic and um, hopefully soon the post-pandemic world. So first up, we're going to have Jade Bui from the Norwegian Data Protection Authority. And she's going to discuss the specific roles, responsibilities, and liabilities when it comes to controllers, processors, and big question mark here, technology providers, um, when it comes to implementing privacy by design. Then second, we're going to have Athena Borka from the European Union Agency for Cybersecurity, ANISA, who's going to dig into the details of uh, the concept of state of the art and what it means and who's responsible for driving it. Then we're going to have Achim Klabunde, uh, who is advisor to the supervisor on data protection and technology. Um, and he is going to talk about how controllers can demonstrate the effectiveness of data protection by design safeguards and um, measures. And then finally, uh, last but not least, we will have Professor Cecilia magnuson Showberry, who is going to talk about the relationship between AI and privacy by design. So Jade, why don't you kick us off? Thank you. Um, okay, so I have a presentation here. Uh, before I go into the roles and responsibilities of controllers and processors, uh, I would like to take you through just the basics of uh, data protection by design and by default. Um, okay. Yes. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so, about the GDPR Article 25, uh, as many of you may know, it's about uh, the obligation to implement data protection by design and data protection by default. Now, data protection by default is built into the design criteria. It's just a more specific criteria reminding the controllers of what they must do at the outset of the processing as a default setting. Uh, so, the essence of Article 25 uh, is to require the controllers to implement the data protection principles into the processing. This means that the processing must have data protection built into the system in general. So they cannot be excused that they don't have the ability to, for example, delete personal data because it needs to be built in. Uh, so what does this consist of, this requirement of data protection by design? It means that the controllers must choose the appropriate measures and the necessary safeguards to implement these data protection principles and the rights of the data subjects into the processing. And it also means that these measures that they implement must be effective at actually ensuring uh, the rights and freedoms and the principles. Uh, it's not sufficient to only uh, implement measures if they have no effect. Uh, and when considering uh, what measures and safeguards to put in place, uh, there are guiding elements in Article 25 uh, to help controllers determine uh, what is appropriate um, and necessary. So these are what we call the elements. Um, and when do uh, controllers have to implement these uh, measures and safeguards? Um, so first, I'm going to go through just these four uh, points that I've talked about. Uh, and then go on to the rules. Okay, so the appropriate measures uh, are um, means that are suitable uh, to achieve the intended purpose. Here it is uh, to implement the data protection principles and the rights and freedoms. 
And measures can be, it's a broad term, both measures and safeguards. They can be both technical or organizational. And it could be anything from the basic training of personnel uh, against uh, clicking on phishing emails to using advanced AI to protect cybersecurity, uh, I mean, information security. Um, and when choosing these technical uh, and organizational measures, one must take into account the uh, elements of data protection, which I will come back to, uh, such as context and risk, it's named as examples here. And uh, one may use a renowned standards and benchmarks. However, if uh, such standards or benchmarks are to be used, the controllers are liable to assess that these are actually uh, substantively sound and do not follow them blindly. They have to see if this actually uh, gives them good guidance for their needs. And on to the criteria of effective implementation. Uh, this is actually at the core that the uh, appropriate measures must be. Um, sorry, next slide. Thank you. Uh, that the if the appropriate measures must actually be effective. And what does this mean? It means that the uh, controllers have to ensure that um, the uh, means of processing actually protect the data protection uh, principles in a manner that is intended. And uh, therefore, they have to uh, specify and fine tune each measure to meet their specific needs. So if you are to buy off the shelf products or ready made um, processing systems, then they must uh, configure it to tailor to be tailored to their specific needs. Um, and the uh, Processing system must also be designed in a way that it can handle any changes in the risk picture. For example, if any new risk uh, arise or if there's increased risk, they must be able to scale the processing or change the system somehow to meet these new risks. Um, and also they must be able to demonstrate how they've actually considered this criteria of effectiveness. Why are the measures that they've taken, uh, that they put into place and implemented into the processing actually protecting the uh, data protection principles how. And in doing so, they can, uh, we recommend that they keep the documentation uh, for this. And also they can use KPIs, which are key performance indicators. Uh, they don't need to use any uh, um, set key performance indicators. This is just uh, for them to choose themselves what they think is a good measure of good data protection. Uh, or they can just have a qualitative reasoning of why they think a measure is actually suitable for the means that they have uh, set out, for the purpose that they've set out. Um, so just short, um, the elements of data protection by design are, for example, considering the state of the art uh, or the cost of implementing data protection um, or then taking into account the nature, scope and context of the purpose of the purpose of the processing, and also taking into account the risks uh, of varying likelihood and severity for the rights and freedoms of natural persons. So these are all contributing factors to assess what is appropriate and effective measures uh, and are not mandatory in and of themselves, but they can be a good guiding factor. Um, So when do controllers actually need to implement uh, data protection by design and by default? It is, there's two points in time. There's one is at, at the time of determination of the means. This means that it is when determine, de determining what uh, measures they're gonna put into place and how they're gonna process the personal data. They must already think about, how, think about data protection in that process. Um, so this is before the processing takes place. It's at this stage that they can make the choices of what is appropriate and what is effective and uh, do the assessments before they start the processing. And the second point is at the time of the processing itself. So this is after the processing is started and it's under processing, there's an obligation to continue maintenance of the data protection principles and update the systems and do regular reviews to ensure that it's still meeting the intended purpose of uh, granting data protection. So if a measure that you put in place and you um, consider was good enough to meet certain data protection needs, turns out after a year, after a review, you consider that it's no longer um, effective as you thought it would be, then it's time to change. Uh, and this 
a criteria to build in data protection by design at the time of processing itself means that this also this requirement of article Article 25 of data protection by design and by default also applies to legacy systems that uh, were in place before the uh, GDPR entered into force because this is a maintenance uh, requirement. So if you have old systems that were designed before GDPR, you still need to update uh, these processing systems to be in line with the data protection by design and by default requirements. Okay, uh, and now I'm going to talk about the roles and responsibilities of the different parties. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, the controller is the um, actor addressed in Article 25. This means that they are the main responsible party. Uh, and this applies to all controllers. This is independent of size or complexity. Um, it could be a small organization to a small one, and it also includes SMEs. Uh, small and medium enterprises. Um, so they are responsible for all the design and default elements of processing uh, and also for design of processing that is used that is made by others as long as they use it in their own processing. So they have this obligation to oversee that everything that they use in their own processing is actually um, meets the criteria of data protection by design and by default. <laughs> so, um, yeah, in essence, they, they have the uh, burden of data protection by design and by default. But as we know, uh, they are not the only people uh, designing um, processing systems, software and hardware. So how can we, um, how can we help controllers um, meet the criteria of data protection by design and by default? So when using processors, uh, we must remember that processors act on behalf of controllers. They are, the controllers are the ones that are responsible and they are the ones that need to make data protection, no, I mean, processing agreements uh, with the processors that actually ensure that data protection by design and by default is, um, is a criteria that they should take care of. They should, uh, for example, um, choose processors that do guarantee good routines and transparency uh, towards data protection by design. They should require maintenance routines um, that they carry out regular reviews of the effective implementation of the data protection principles. Um, they should ask that the processors keep the controllers up to date on the developments in the state of the art. Um, we recommend that these um, requirements are uh, included in clauses within the data protection that data processing agreements so that it's baked into the relationship with the processor. Uh, and um, we would love to see that this um, facilitation of data protection by design and by default becomes an advantage for processors that they can see this opportunity, that it facilitates the work of controllers and that they um, uh, yeah, facilitate it. Um, okay, and then next I'm going to talk about how producers of hardware and software products can also aid uh, and contribute to data protection by design and by default. And uh, here, um, software and hardware uh, producers are not directly um, addressed in Article 25 in any way, but uh, so when controllers buy ready-made products, they have to remember to configure the products to their specific needs and only use what is necessary uh, for their own processing. So one must remember uh, the requirements of data protection by default. So if you buy a software and it has all these default configurations, you need to reconfigure so that you don't process more personal data than what is necessary for your own processing needs. And this is also something one can have in dialogue with the software and hardware providers that these are the needs that we have and this is what um, we need for our processing uh, and configure in a way that it's not more invasive than it should be just because one used a product that is uh, ready-made. And we would also encourage for transparency uh, of tr hardware and software providers so that uh, controllers can independently assess their means of processing. What are they actually using? How is this uh, data protection friendly? 
Uh, and how is this effective? What are the KPIs that have been used? How have they assessed the uh, protection of the data protection principles and the rights and freedoms of data subjects? And because controllers do have an obligation to be able to demonstrate this. So if they buy ready-made products, they need to know themselves how uh, these implement the data protection principles. And they must also be able to demonstrate this. So this is a call for transparency to facilitate this for um, the controllers that actually have this burden on their shoulders. So that was um, my presentation uh, about the roles and responsibilities. Thank you. And I'll give the word back to Liana. Hi, thank you so much, Jade. That was an excellent presentation and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions for you at the end, but now we're gonna hop over to Athena Bork from Anissa, who's gonna talk about um, the concept of state of the art. Hello, thank you, Leanne, for the introduction. Uh, can we see the slides? Yes, thank you. So, um, yes, as Lian uh, said in uh, my intervention, I will focus mostly on the notion of the state of the art in data protection by design and by default. This is actually something that was already mentioned uh, by uh, Jade just before as one of the parameters to define the state. Uh, the, um, compliance with Article 25. And in fact, we see also the uh, notion of the state of the art, uh, not only in Article 25, but also in Article 32 uh, for the security of processing. So in this intervention today, what I will try to do is explore uh, in a little, bit more, a little bit more detail what is the notion of the state of the art, and then um, rather throw some questions for the discussion rather than answering them directly on how we can assess and define the state of the art, which is actually a very complex uh, question in, from a practical point of view, and this is what I would try to, to show today. So, um, please, next slide. So, thank you. So, um, I, I will start with the notion of the state of the art. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, this definition that you can see here comes from the uh, latest uh, EDBB guidelines on data protection by design and by default, which was mentioned before by Jade. Uh, so the definition is that the uh, state of the art is the technology level of a service or technology or product that exists in the market and is most effective in achieving the objectives identified. Actually, this definition is based on the definition given uh, by the Federal Constitutional Court of Germany, and I will come to that in a minute as well. Uh, but uh, I would like to highlight three very important aspects from my point of view uh, in this uh, definition. Um, first of all, we see that it is about, state of the art is about a technology, a service or a product that exists in the market. So we already have a certain level of maturity. It is not something completely new. It is not just an idea. That's an important element, first of all. Secondly, it has to be the most effective way of achieving our objectives. So this is very much linked to the effective implementation, the effectiveness, the element of effectiveness that is so much highlighted also in the EDBB's guidelines, and we heard about that by Jade uh, just before. Uh, and then uh, uh, as a third point, uh, um, uh, I believe that exactly because of this nature of being the most effective uh, measure uh, in the case in question every time, it also needs to have an objective character, the state of the art. While the objectives that we have, the processing operations might change, and they will change uh, from time to time, uh, the, the state of the art itself needs to have an objective character in order to be measured. And I think this is an important element to consider also uh, in the course of this presentation. So, um, next slide, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, here, uh, um, uh, you can see this uh, definition that I mentioned before uh, from the Federal um, uh, Constitutional Court of uh, uh, Germany in the Kalkars uh, decision uh, already many years ago in 1978, uh, which was also actually used uh, last year uh, in uh, Teletrust uh, T guidelines on the state of the art. Teletrust is the IT Security Association in Germany, uh, and this report was issued in cooperation with ENISA. So uh, you can see here that um, 
uh, according to just this um, understanding of the state of the art, we actually have three stages, th three um, different stages of the technology, let's say. And actually, these stages are very much interlinked with each other. At the very bottom, we have the technology that can be, let's say, it's generally accepted, it are the generally accepted rules of technology. It's proven technology, it works, it's mature, but maybe it is starting to diminish, starting to be outdated. Then at the top level, we have the scientific knowledge and research, so a lot of innovation, ideas, but not a lot of proof in the market. Uh, so between very mature technologies, but not so much innovative, and very much innovation, but not so much proof, we have the state of the art. So basically, the state of the art is, on one hand, needs to have a level of innovation, but then at the same time, it also needs to have a certain of maturity in the market. This is uh, the definition here. So. Um, how can we measure the state of the art? Uh, if we follow this uh, approach of um, recognition versus uh, proof in practice, we can see this um, two-dimensional, let's say, um, uh, measurement of the state of the art, which was actually followed in this report I mentioned uh, before of Teletrusty. Uh, so uh, we need to assess uh, these two different aspects and combine them. On one hand, the level of recognition, on the other hand, proof in practice. And uh, this, uh, according uh, to this uh, methodology at least, uh, can be done with uh, basically quantitative criteria, as you can see here. For instance, in order to measure the level of recognition of a technology, we can look into available documentation, recognize standards and certifications. This was actually also mentioned in the ADBB's guidelines. Also, um, recommendations issued by recognized committees uh, and, and then when we want to prove, uh, when we uh, want to assess uh, the level of proof in practice, we need to see how, um, how a technology, how a, a technology that is mature but uh, has been updated over the years, uh, how is it tested, uh, uh, if we have any comparable measures. So basically, as I said, quantitative criteria. And actually, uh, using this methodology, and this particular analysis of the guidelines, which I would I would like to say that it's about IT security measures, it's not about privacy enhancing technologies. Uh, we we have an assessment of the state of the art of different security measures, but again at a high level, not specific products and services, but general categories of security measures, like for instance different authentication techniques, for example, or encryption techniques. But then. Uh, um, is uh, a quantitative assessment sufficient to define the state of the art? This is a question that we actually asked also our, um, ourselves uh, at ANISA uh, when we worked into uh, developing an, uh, an a framework for the assessment of the maturity of pets, of privacy enhancing technologies. Uh, this was done in 2015. And, um, in that analysis, we actually uh, considered two different dimensions. On one hand, uh, the level of readiness of a technology, which is very much related to what I was saying before. So um, uh, how can we um, find this right balance between a pure idea and something that is really very well proven, but uh, about to be outdated. So state of the art lies in the middle. Uh, but then at the other, on the other hand, we also need to assess quality. And uh, when we talk about pets also, we have, uh, it's not only about um, the security measure itself, it's also about the data protection uh, um, that it can offer. So uh, in the quality parameters, for instance, that we worked, uh, we used in that methodology, uh, you can see uh, the level of protection, uh, the trust assumptions that we make when we use a particular uh, privacy enhancing technology, the side effects that this can have, and a number, of, uh, a number of other parameters like the reliability, the performance, the efficiency of a technology, uh, the operability, maintainability as well, which is again very much related to um, proof uh, in the market, uh, and transferability. Um, now, um, with this background, I would now like to bring to the discussion these uh, three important questions, which I believe are very, uh, really essential uh, for the dis general discussion on the state of the art. Uh, the first question, which I already um, touched upon uh, a little bit, is how to perform this assessment? How can we assess the state of the art? And yes, we need to look into measurable indicators, 
but is this sufficient? And if not, can we rely also on expert opinions? How can we combine this in an objective way? Because I said, as I said in the beginning, the state of the art needs to be objective so as to be at the end to be able to, under, to, 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 to prove that yes, we, we use uh, the most effective measure to achieve our data protection objectives. And then what is the form that this assessment can take? And what is the depth? Is it a high level assessment? Is it a more detailed assessment on specific services and tools? Uh, can, does it have to take the form necessarily of the assessment of a technology per se, or it can build on particular examples, for instance? And I would like to say that this last approach is something that we have followed at ANISA over the uh, past years, where we have worked quite a lot in the area of data pseudonymization, uh, trying to provide, to, 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 to support, let's say, the state of the art in this field by providing information of the, on the available technologies, for instance, but not only by means of defining the technologies themselves and the readiness they have in the market, but also by defining examples and specific use cases. And I personally believe this is very, very important also for the definition of the state of the art in uh, the area of privacy and data protection. Then the second important question, who defines the state of the art? Should it be a single actor, an association, a um, public body, or should it be a community approach? And again, here I would like to say that at Anisa we, we tried to follow this community approach some years ago when we wanted to develop a, a PETS uh, maturity assessment uh, tool. Uh, uh, but of course, this is of co the idea here is that uh, we, we, in order to have this objective assessment, uh, but using also uh, um, uh, qualitative uh, criteria, we need to have uh, as, ma as many experts as possible on board. Uh, it, it's a very ambitious idea, uh, but uh, it, it, it goes towards the, uh, the overall notion of open source, I would say also here. Uh, but then many other questions are, 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 are born here uh, with a community approach. Who is going to drive it? How can it be maintained? And so on and so forth. And uh, the last question that I also believe is very important is about the audience uh, and uh, how to present the state of the art, because it is very, very different uh, to who we are referring. It's very different when we talk to developers, when we talk to controllers, when we talk to end users about their own uh, use, for instance, of online tools or um, mobile apps. So. Um, as I said from the beginning, I, I, I don't have the answers to all these questions. We have done uh, uh, for many years at Anisa some work and uh, some research on various of these topics, but uh, uh, I believe that we still need to explore as a community much more this understanding and this assessment of the state of the art, which is so fundamental to understand what is the level of the technology that would be the most effective to uh, uh, reach the, 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 the objectives that we have uh, at a given point in time. Uh, now, uh, just uh, some final thoughts uh, to end this uh, intervention. Uh, first of all, uh, and it was mentioned also by Jade, uh, we should not look at the state of the art only at the technological level. It is not only about technical measures, it's about also organizational measures. The DBB also highlighted that quite clearly in its guidelines. Uh, another uh, important element, I think, uh, is that uh, we need to see the connection between the state of the art and the cost of implementation. Another parameter that we see uh, in Article 25 for the adoption of uh, uh, technical and organizational measures. Uh, and uh, because uh, there's obviously such a connection and uh, uh, we need to, uh, to look uh, uh, on one hand on the technology that can give us the most effective option, but at the same time, uh, also it has to be uh, the less resource demanding te technology in order to be realistic at the end, especially for um, smaller organizations like SMEs, which of course are also subject to the obligation of data protection uh, by design and by default and to security of processing as well, where we have the state of the art as an important parameter too. Uh, and as a last comment, are we there yet? Uh, yes, obviously we are not. Uh, and this is a continuous process in any case. State of the art is not something, it's not an one off exercise. Uh, uh, but as I said, I, I believe that we need to look uh, as a community uh, to, towards a repository of tools, but also of use cases of, and of examples that can help us define the state of the art in uh, its different situation. Thank you very much for your attention. 
Uh, thank you so much, Athena. That was uh, extremely interesting. And uh, we will now move on to Achim uh, Tabunde from um, the EPDS. And he is going to talk about the effectiveness of certain privacy by design measures. Um, and uh, yeah, take us away, uh, Achim. have it on the on the first slide that it cannot be seen without uh, two other adjectives like the appropriate quality of the measures the measures to be appropriate and uh, the question of the integration of the measures and i'll try to explain that a little bit in my presentation um, i'm uh, put things a bit into context i'll also go a bit back in the historical development from privacy by design to data protection by design look at the text again of article 25 as my as previous speakers have been done and, uh, and this shouldn't be oh here the core concept now is effective and then uh, questions for further thinking not yet the q a session so um the I'm here for the EDPS, the European Data Protection Supervisor, that is the Data Protection Authority, which oversees the processing by the European institutions, the institutions of the EU themselves, and also the EFTA Secretariat, actually, which uh, uh, includes some the other countries of the EEA. Um, the tasks of the EDPS are the same as for um, many other DPAs at national level. It's a supervision of the processing, first and foremost, as it's in the name. Then it's giving advice to the EU legislator, which is the Commission, the European Parliament and the Council. And uh, the EDPS also uh, has its own team to monitor technological developments with an impact on privacy and um, obviously uh, the use of AI technologies is one issue, but also facial recognition and other things which take a lot of attention. And in the context of the title of our session, of course, lots of questions related to data processing in the context of uh, pandemics. Um, and the cooperation with other DPAs so, and uh, other um, organizations is, of course, crucial. Um, the put things into context, this was a slide uh, for the benefit of uh, less um, of an audience which is not so experienced with the data protection, but uh, many people, for many people the GDPR came out of the blue and uh, created a whole new world. And this is just to explain that this is not the case, uh, that there were ancestors going back to the 1970s at national and regional level and uh, at international level instruments from the 1980s and then of course in the 1990s um, directive 9546 and uh, yeah uh, sisters of the parents is the privacy directive which is dated 2002 but also goes back to 98 with its uh, predecessor and the instrument for the law enforcement and uh, police um, field and then lastly, the regulation that um, um, governs the uh, data processing by uh, the EU institutions themselves. And many of them have been replaced in the meantime. And uh, the e-privacy regulation is a pending issue in the legislative process for since four years now, about uh, a week ago, four years, the proposal was made. Um, the uh, GDPR brought a number of changes, but uh, most important in the context of this presentation and this uh, panel today is the field of accountability, which includes a number of principles. It includes data protection impact assessment, uh, assessment and then data protection by design and by default, which is here the nerdy acronym DPB. D square and then the mandatory data protection officer and uh, so on. And that's setting a bit the, the frame and the context where we are. Here we have again the data protection principles. Uh, there's different um, 
counting, but uh, Article 5 of the GDPR lists many of them. And uh, security and data subject rights are uh, also to be counted. So in, in this, I think it's nine principles which we have on this one. Okay. Uh, on uh, the historical development, the main point to keep in mind is that data protection by design and by default is now an obligation and no longer a good practice as it has been for 15 years before. And um, privacy by design and there's uh, foundational documents, the principles as uh, proposed by Anka Vukian as the Privacy Commissioner of Ontario and Canada and discussed with many other people like uh, uh, also some Dutch uh, practitioners and uh, professors worked on that. And the EDPS tried to advance uh, or made an effort to advance this discussion well, about two and a half years ago, pointing out where we should go beyond what's in the GDPR. And this is uh, still something which needs to be developed further. Um, but let's get back to the legal reality. Um, there we are. This is um, the text of uh, Article 25 of the GDPR, and I have underlined and emphasized the three terms uh, effective, of course, bold and underlined, which as uh, Leon has announced, and then the sister terms, in my view, that need to be considered together with it appropriate and to integrate something. So, um, appropriate is a uh, yeah okay then this now shouldn't be there so okay we move on and skip this one yeah so um on the background um is of course the guidance the guidelines issued by the edpb and the second version last October, which Jade has already mentioned, and I will refer a bit to some of the explanations in these guidelines. And it, there's also a relationship to guidance the EDPS has issued on, on technical matters. There's an overarching guidance on the entirety of IT governance and IT management in an organization, and then there are uh, vertical uh, selected guidelines on different uh, technologies and uh, another horizontal element on the specific aspects of security. And uh, most of these were done in 2016 and uh, some in 2018. And of course, those that were done before the GDPR and the other instruments are under revision. But uh, still, there's many principles and the most of the, the substance will uh, still be valid. So we have the keywords here uh, in the guidelines, appropriate, effective, and integrated, as I said. Appropriate uh, refers to what is generally discussed as a risk-based approach of the GDPR. And uh, the guidelines of the EDPB say here being appropriate means that the measures and necessary safeguards should be suited to achieve the intended purpose. And that means they must be implement uh, things effectively. So there's the connection between uh, the two terms and effective. What does effective mean? And this can only be fully understood in my view uh, if it's put into the context of accountability. And the context of accountability is that the controller is able to demonstrate that uh, the measures and safeguards are um, actually uh, work in protecting uh, the rights of the individuals by adhering to the data protection principles and by mitigating uh, the risks, but not the risks to the organization itself, as it is the usual perspective in uh, IT security management, but the risks to the individuals whose data is concerned, which means that in a GDPR risk assessment and data protection impact assessment, there is a different perspective to be taken than the perspective um, that's um, usually used uh, when an organization evaluates the, the risks to its own thing. But uh, effective 
also means um, that um, the concrete situation, the concrete processing operation needs to be taken into account. So there's no one size fits all uh, checklist, generic checklist that uh, works. And there is even no uh, guarantee that the measure that is effective today will still be effective in a, in a couple of years. And the, the last point, uh, the last keyword here, integrated, um, which says, um, translates or is very similar to the word by design. So it's not, an, it's not something which is an afterthought or which can be added at a later stage, but it's something which needs to be there from, from the start and be actually an integrative part of the IT or processing operation from the very start at all its layers and through all phases and um, um, uh, including that's the operation and so um, uh, that leads me to the summary already so uh, as I just was saying the data protection requirements which derive from the principles from any risk or threat analysis must be considered at each step of implementation and operation we have been criticized for the EPS guidelines that we um, uh, based the structure to some parts on widespread industry um, guidance and industry procedures, which seem to uh, uh, be using um, or be based on the so-called waterfall model of uh, software development, which uh, some people think is outdated in the time of agile development but this is a, a, a misunderstanding because also in agile um, people need to consider what they want to achieve with with their development and uh, uh, so privacy data protection is just something that they need to achieve and it's not a there's no option it's like uh, nobody would say this app is perfect only we cannot monetize it there's no way to make any money from this app that would probably not go very far and in a similar way if it doesn't uh, respect data protection principles it cannot go very far and that should be very clear i've already emphasized that to be effective measures have to be specific uh, so really for the situation at hand and uh, there's no checklist or no um, book of checklists with uh, one to choose from it really needs to be done in each and every case and it cannot be done once and for all and then it's now ever. There is always a need to review and adapt either regularly or triggered by um, a significant changes in the context or in the processing um, itself. Um, I, I had thought to put the uh, 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 usual uh, plan, do, check, act, check, act cycle on one of the slides, but uh, uh, everybody can see it in so many presentations of uh, consulting uh, companies that it's really not necessary to recall that visually for this for this presentation. And the last point that I would like to make here is that design obviously uh, is often understood as a specific uh, phase in the software development process. So there's a so-called design phase and there are actually in reality there are several design um, points where uh, diff at different levels of detail and different parts of a, of a system design um, design is, is being done. But what, what we need to look at here is the big picture, which does not only concern the technology, the tools and the IT system, but, and that's also the point of our um, IT governance and management guidelines, that the entire system around and and uh, the um, needs to be uh, taken into account. So uh, it's actually the structure with which the organization manages and designs its processing operations, which is also very important because uh, it's too late when you are already at the implementation and then you find out that uh, someone has made a requirement which is difficult to reconcile with data protection principles. So that should be analyzed very, very early in the process. And um, 
that was basically already the summary, but I promised uh, to show up uh, a few questions, uh, which are not so much uh, questions um, to any person present here, but it's uh, things which I believe should be addressed in the in the further going discussion. So, is there already good practice for determining appropriate measures in data protection terms? Uh, are there any measurements quantifiable or qu qualitative um, on effectiveness that could be used? Um, obviously, standards and practices. We have a first uh, standard with ISO 27701, uh, but there are others. Are there others forthcoming? Which role could they play? And uh, Jade has already mentioned the distribution of responsibility with controller and processor, and many people are also looking at the manufacturers of tools and systems. Then as a public sector data protection authority, of course, for the EDPS, the question is important. What can the public sector do? And uh, well, have a look at the EDPS panels, which uh, also look at that question to some extent. And uh, also for supervisory authorities, um, we have, of course, to improve constantly our uh, supervision um, um, tech methods and tools. And that's it. I think I have just the, the closing slide. Oh, no, I, I wanted to mention the Internet Privacy Engineering Network, which is uh, a network set up by the EDPS in 2014, which brings together people from industry, academia, civil society and authorities to discuss on the technological methods to improve data protection. Yeah, and that was really the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Akam. We will um, jump now to C Professor Cecilia Magnusson Showberry, um, who's going to discuss uh, privacy by design and AI. Thank you very much. Um, and um, I will, thank you, Leanne. Uh, I will um, pinpoint one aspect of data protection and modern information communications technologies and just point out some issues concerning uh, AI, artificial intelligence and data protection by design and default. Uh, and uh, given the limited time, uh, I will say a few words about the governing uh, framework, say a few words about the legal setting uh, and uh, uh, illustrate certain components in an AI based approach. And um, I cannot refrain from uh, concluding that data protection by design and default is easier said than done. And that's something that no doubt has been uh, made clear during the previous interventions. Um, I will end my very brief presentation by a few uh, concluding remarks. So, um, well, the legal, the legal setting is, um, well, I characterize no surprise, of course, the GDPR perspective and the EDPB guidelines. Um, although these, uh, uh, and, um, uh, although this uh, presentation and this slot, this panel is very much about Article 25, I would like to also bring in uh, aspects of uh, Article uh, Article 5. Uh, there is a very interesting interplay between those two um, provisions, not least in an AI uh, context. Uh, and um, AI, artificial intelligence, uh, I'll come back to major characteristics, but um, there is no doubt that the uh, design um, of uh, AI-based solutions challenge fundamental data protection principles. And just as kind of snapshots, uh, I, I can just point out uh, the uh, principle of transparency and the difficulties that AI using machine learning and uh, AI uh, having this black box problem in terms of um, 
uh, not least uh, algorithms that are self-learning uh, and uh, more or less makes it impossible to have a proper openness in, in that context. Another example, um, because you could actually give similar kinds of ex examples throughout the, the whole uh, Article 5, uh, has to do with the um, importance of data minimization, whereas AI uh, is very much characterized by the opposite in terms of big data. So th that's um, that's definitely a challenge. Furthermore, uh, Article 15, I didn't put it down in the slides, but Article 15 in the DDPR about rights of access is yet another uh, challenging regulation in the DDPR from an AI uh, perspective, given the fact that this um, uh, th that the, this part of the regulation uh, requires possibility or uh, an, an ability on behalf of the controllers to explain uh, the underlying uh, logic of automated individual decision making, including profiling Article 22. So uh, just by uh, putting on the glasses of AI, uh, you, you stumble right into um, very uh, fundamental um, issues. So, um, Article 5 need to be um, considered, next slide please, uh, in, in, in the context of um, uh, legal, well, the, the regulation and considering the time and the wish to um, have a, some feedback from the audience, I will not go into the details of this provision because we've heard so much about it in a very interesting reflecting way. So, well, Article 25, in addition to um, um, Article 5, Article 25, a very important uh, and interesting uh, interrelationship, I would say, not least from uh, the point of view of um, AI. Um, yes. So moving on to the guidelines that also has been um, in, in um, has been uh, illuminated uh, by previous speakers, um, it's interesting to um, find a, a few points of AI relevant issues, and uh, just uh, if you have a look at the. Um, the uh, regulation addressing accuracy uh, marked in yellow, I point at or I take a notice of the fact that I, there is a distinction being made between manual decision making, automated decision making or through artificial intelligence. And then when it comes to personal data processing, it's uh, these distinctions are, are really important. Um, what manual decision making is possibly not as tricky to 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 um, capture, whereas automated traditional conventional automated decision making um, in relation to artificial intelligence comprising decision making is 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 quite uh, challenging. It's not clear cut what is on the one hand automated decision making, on the other AI based decision making, and there are, when it boils down to actually um, applying uh, these um, provisions, it becomes necessary. So that's a, dist a distinction that I find really important. And um, uh, there is also a need, I would argue, that to, to combine the um, general um, AI uh, worries or AI concerns um, in, in the context of accuracy, um, to, uh, the, the conventional AI-based concerns to, to um, such things as a biased data sets. And I also think that the guidelines um, from the EDPB is important uh, and I wish there were more to read about are these examples for as exemplified in terms of an insurance company that wishes to use AI to profile customers um, buying insurance? Uh, that's a typical um, kind of of uh, application that um, has the AI component being made made explicit. So what I'm trying, what I'm arguing is that there is a need 
to go beyond traditional automated individual decision making and ex well explicitly to 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 the Okay, I'm advised to wrap it up, uh, and uh, so I think there is a need to to expand upon uh, knowledge, uh, more knowledge about AI from the point of view of privacy, data protection. Uh, that is technically very specific in terms of um, computer power, statistics, mathematics. The uh, machine learning approaches are so challenging. Uh, with, the, with regard to the articles I previously mentioned, Article 15, 22, 5 and 25 in the GDPR and associated documents. I've, okay, so uh, wrapping up, uh, someone said that the camera is upside down. I, I will have to survive that. Uh, but AI... AI is not just any technology. It it is definitely challenging from a privacy point of view, data protection point of view, and um, the distinctions I previously mentioned between uh, conventional automation and AI needs to be further investigated in. And uh, there is also um, a need for applying uh, AI-based um, approaches to um, large-scale application sets and learning analytics. So um, AI, I would argue, is, uh, is a, a special kind, gives data, personal data protection, a special profile. Um, so a concluding remarks um, in the, within the context of pandem pandemics coming from Sweden, it's a very special situation. It's very sad indeed, and that it has been too, too late for too many when it comes to uh, what, what, what happens. Uh, so um, to the extent AI could support um, work with apps of different kinds, it would of course be uh, very, very uh, valuable. Otherwise, uh, I would like to say that although I've argued that AI is a very specific aspect to data protection, we should not uh, find ourselves in, in in a situation where we where we kind of dis distinguish AIs as different. But we need to look at the, the uh, have a functional analysis, focusing to uh, focusing indeed. Uh, on algorithms and dynamic algorithms in the context of machine learning. So um, AI needs to be, be, be uh, 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 investigated into, but we sh it's important that we do not end up with formalities uh, from a legal point of view, trying to uh, create legal definitions, um, compare Article 4 and the GDPR, for instance, that are not really practical, but just a formal aspect. So just we need to work with AI, but from a functional point of view, and uh, in order to bridge not least methodological gaps when it comes to algorithms, uh, both what we can learn from well, lessons learned from previous uh, design uh, to what goes on today. And well, legal tech in, in, in different uh, variations, including AI best solutions, no doubt um, are is here to stay. So we better embrace the new technologies and and uh, uh, dig into the definitions and and the practicalities uh, as much as as possible. Um, I think that was. That was it. I better stop here, um, given the time frame. Thank you for your attention. Uh, um, hi, I, I hope that I have invited the, the individuals who have asked some questions um, to the chat. Uh, uh, not sure but anyway i can ask the first question um which was the same that was posed by one of the audience members um i think it's kind of funny because it was my first question it was for athena and um i have discovered in my own research and also through your presentation today that anita is attempting to develop a pet maturity repository um, which is community driven and independent from private companies and i as well as al Mohan 
Momami from Ohm University are curious if you could tell us um, a little bit more about this project. Yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Lian, um, for the question. Uh, well, actually, uh, Enisa wanted to initiate this uh, because, as exactly as you said, as I said also in my presentation, our idea was to build um, a community approach towards best assessment. So it's not we don't really want to do. It's not like Enisa is going to do the best assessment. The idea was that uh, we will have a platform where um, event providers themselves uh, can uh, uh, invite experts to provide particular opinions based on the criteria that we have defined and then maybe we have different opinions and like that uh, we can um, broaden our understanding and our knowledge on the state of the art um, I must say that uh, we haven't really made uh, a lot of progress uh, why because uh, even in this um, in this community approach actually you need to have a driver uh, and this has been the difficult part here um, sorry Yes, uh, sorry, I, w I was informed that there is someone uh, who is going to present the question. Is that correct? Or should I continue? Uh, hi, my, yeah, I was the one who asked the question actually, but yeah, uh, they already addressed it. So you're answering it. It's already, it's already fine. Yeah. So okay. You can continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, what I would say is that uh, uh, what Enisa has developed, Enisa is a public institution, a public agency. What Enisa has developed is um, an open source tool. It's um, an open methodology. Uh, and so uh, it's, it can be reused. It can be um, anybody can take it and use it for, for, for the common good. Of course, it's not, uh, it's not uh, um, something to profit from, but it's, uh, this was the idea from the beginning to uh, put together uh, all those researchers and uh, all those providers uh, of pets uh, in order to um, uh, be able to uh, analyze the technologies as much as possible. Uh, reality has shown that there are many challenges. And uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, while it is uh, the most, uh, let's say, uh, inclusive process, at the same time, you need a driver. Uh, and so we're still looking into that. Uh, we have uh, also uh, at a certain point, point of time also talked to DPS about this and uh, um, uh, it's still uh, in progress, I would say. Okay, thank I hope you I very answered much. the question. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, is uh, Francesca in the room with us or shall I just ask the question on her behalf? Okay, she'll be here in one second, so we'll let her ask. But um, I, I, this question has to do with contact tracing app. Okay. Yeah. Wenkai, why don't you? Why yes. Don't you? Yes, I'm here. Am I audible? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, thanks for all of your uh, speeches. M my question is: um, uh, Would would that be uh, too much burden to the data controllers to review the measures that has been implemented? because the data environment is dynamic and uh, the technologies are uh, uh, developing. So there will always be a uh, risk emerging. So if the controllers want to be responsible, they need to uh, conduct uh, endlessly uh, assessment and a review. So would that be a burden? Thanks. Uh, I think, Akram, this one is probably directed most to you. Yeah, thank you, Leon. Um, well, uh, if you have, uh, I mean, if you have the principle of accountability, which is not limited to data protection, but which exists also in, in, in other fields of um, uh, areas which are relevant in other fields which are relevant for the management of an enterprise then you will find that, that this is nothing uh, specific but that's something that you do all the time um, 
I mean, you uh, you have to be sure that you are compliant with tax laws, with consumer protection rules, with the civil code of the country. This is only the the legal, and and of course, when uh, when things change, there's constantly um, that processes are reviewed. Also, the the optimization and improvement is a constant process, and it's just that this process, which should exist anyway, in in any relevant organization, the um, um, compliance needs and the um, risk limiting features, which are there to protect the fundamental rights of those people whose data you are processing or the controllers processing is just one element in a, in a, in a, a review thing. So, uh, no, it's, it's no specific burden. It's uh, something which, which happens anyway. Okay, we have a question here concerning um, the contact tracing apps that are being developed in the pandemic um, situation. Um, do we have the um, question asker in the room with us? No, okay. Okay, so the the question is, considering the COVID-19 app surge, how do you evaluate the use of the decentralized framework for contact tracing apps, in particular, taking into account Anissa's framework for pets maturity assessment? So I suppose this one is directed to a a Athena, although um, Jade and Cecilia are also welcome to jump in. Uh, and Achim. <laughs> Achim, would you like to, to go first? Yeah, maybe I, I actually I had a, a, a tweet about this subject, maybe I've uh, indirectly triggered the, the question. Um, we had an event in October at, for, for the EDPS where we discussed with uh, people um, involved in either making or supervising some of the um, 14 or 15 contact tracing apps in, in Europe. And um, also a colleague of Jade from the Norwegian DPA was there. Uh, and um, the point is, uh, most uh, adopted the, the decentral decentralized uh, cases, other approaches were, were gone. And there's now a lot of discussion that uh, there are still infections going on and contact tracing still requires a lot of manual work. But um, I think the the, there is a mismatch of the expectations and uh, what the apps were, were designed to do. In my view, the apps are more or less working in, in what they were going to do, namely helping people to uh, support the contact tracing as far as themselves are concerned. The apps were, those decentralized apps were never meant uh, uh, as a tool for the authorities to, to uh, ease uh, contact tracing, but for people to be helpful. It was designed on the basis of a cooperative citizen who wanted to help the authorities to uh, identify and warn their contacts as quickly as possible. It was never, and that's what some people seem to regret, it was never meant to uh, control resisting individuals, those that don't want to be tracked too far to force them uh, to be tracked. So um, I, I think the uh, still we, we know that uh, there are loops, uh, there may be pitfalls and uh, holes in the in the overall protection. So there could have been more pets and, and more security and there's still a lot of uh, things, but a lot to learn from, from this exercise. Uh, Cecilia, do you want to jump in here? Uh, just, just a very brief comment. Uh, among experiences uh, in, in, in Sweden uh, concerning uh, apps specifically was that um, there were, uh, it, it was, uh, it was shown that there was quite a lot of conventional law, so to speak, missing in order to design and implement the apps. Issues concerning um, procurement uh, and uh, uh, electronic agreements, fundamental conventional legal issues turned out to be an obstacle in addition to questions uh, within the framework of data protection. So rather unexpectedly, a conventional legislation was an obstacle, which indicates the importance of, of having your legal 
uh, infrastructures in place uh, in a normal situation of your society, not urgently when things have already gone wrong and in the context of a pa pa pandem pandemic. Thanks. And then uh, a final point from Athena here on this question. Yes, very quickly. I just uh, wanted to, to mention as a comment that um, um, in this particular situation, we should not uh, only think about the technical solution that was chosen, but uh, about uh, the yeah. choice that was given uh, um, from the beginning. So what I mean here is that, uh, and we, we, we touched upon that uh, before, on one hand, we have the technological choices, but then also we also have uh, uh, the organizational choices that we make when we implement uh, data protection by design. And this is uh, a key parameter also for, for, for the controller to meet in the most effective way the data protection principles. So this question between centralized and decentralized also has to do a lot with that, I would say, as a key design principle and it's not necessarily technical. Thank you. Okay, I think that we have uh, about three minutes left. Um, I would just like to uh, allow the panelists to add any final comments that they would like to. Cecilia? I would like to read more about AI uh, in general in these uh, privacy data protection related information domains. It's high time for that. Thank you. Uh, no other comments? I, I could say just um, as a final comment that um, uh, I think that uh, in the question of practical implementation also related to uh, one of the questions that we had before. One problem I think uh, is that uh, we're always uh, looking um, at the implementation of data protection by design and by default from uh, um, um, from the perspective of um, you know the, the regulator and all the guidance that has been issued, uh, it, it, it follows this path exactly. But this does not necessarily speak the language of, uh, for instance, the developers of products and tools, uh, of uh, those that are really going to implement this in practice. They speak sometimes we speak completely different language. So I think one important issue here for practical implementation is also to try to to, to combine this to and to, to issue more practical guidance for people to. Follow. It's not easy. It's a continuous process, as Akim said. It's not like a one-off thing, but at the same time, it has to be realistic and it has to be possible for those that are asked to implement it to do it in practice. So this as a final comment on my side. Thank you. I think that's an excellent comment to consider the actual users of law. Yeah, Jade, final point on your side? Thank you. Uh, I just want to add to what Athena said that um, although this is coming from a regulator's perspective, the Norwegian Data Protection Authority has a guidance on how to develop software and it is also available in English and it goes through the steps uh, of how one should do this to be in line with data protection by design. Mm, I have actually looked at that. But uh, I think we have to, to wrap up here. And I just wanna thank the panelists and the audience for their attendance. I also wanna say for those out there in the audience, we are recruiting at Erie. We are looking for two Marie Curie doctoral students. So if you wanna come work for us, check out my Twitter, check out the Erie webpage um, and send us your applications. Um, yeah, and with that, again, uh, have, a, have a great rest of, your, of the conference and uh, thank you so much to everyone who was in attendance today. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, you Leon. thank you, everyone. Thank you.